in keeping with, with what we're doing today, the ordination of Michael as a deacon, and the fact that the deacon's heart is a heart of humility. I, I just felt as, as though the Holy Spirit was prompting me today to uh, lead you in, in the, our looking together, the text here, that deals with this very, very important characteristic of, of a deacon, and that is humility. And now listen to me. When I say it's a very important characteristic of a deacon, it's a very important characteristic of every child of God. It's important. It's not that God has a set of standards in relationship to morality and spiritual life that, that He just wants deacons to have and He doesn't care whether you measure up or not. I tell you, God wants all of us to be deacons in the uh, Whether you're ever ordained as a deacon officially, whether or not you ever serve in that position, I tell you, that spiritual life that God demands from a deacon is also demanding from you and from me. And uh, this whole calling to be people of humility to be strongly embraced by all of us this day. And so let's notice what is before us in our text. Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through verse 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached him, approached Jesus, and said, Teacher, we want you to do something for us if we ask you. The way that's translated in some other versions, like in the New King James, it says, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And that's the spirit of what they're saying here. Lord, we want you to just do for us whatever we ask. Now, wait a minute. Don't throw any rocks yet. Your prayer life ever sound like that? Pray we all give it. Lord, we want you to do for us what we ask. And we present our requests sometimes as though our plan is better than God's plan. What we're to be praying about is that God's kingdom come, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, including our life. And even when we're asking for things, there should always be that spirit of heart and mind that Jesus even prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Nevertheless, my Bible will be through with you. You see, all that's void here in this text. We just want you to do what we want you to do, Jesus. We want you to, to, to answer our request unconditionally. Just do for us what we ask you. Then Jesus in verse 36, what do you want me to do? Uh, what do you want me to do for you? He asked them. They answered him, allow us to sit at your right hand and at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We are able, they told him. You talk about speaking more than ignorance. That's one of the most ignorant statements in all the Bible. We are able, they told him. Jesus said, you will drink the cup I drink. And you will be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. I want you to understand they weren't able. It was only by the grace of God that they entered into the suffering of Christ. And they still didn't do it on the level that Jesus did. But to sit at my right or my left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those it has been prepared for. And when the other ten Southern Baptists heard about it, <laughs> they began to be indignant with James and John. Probably because they didn't get to Jesus first, right? Jesus called them over and said to them, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles dominate them. And their men of high positions exercise power over them. But it is not, it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, who want, whoever wants to become great among you must be your, here's the word, Deacon. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your deacon, your minister, your servant. 
And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. Verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be, and it's a form of the, of the word deacon. What Jesus is saying here is, I did not come for somebody to deacon me. I didn't come for somebody to be my servant. Take care of my personal needs outside the kingdom of God. For even the Son of Man did not come to be deaconed unto, but to deacon. That's the literal word Jesus gave. I did not come to have somebody else minister to me and serve me, but I came that I might serve others, that I might minister unto others. You guys who are deacons, I want you to know you're in good company because Jesus is the chief deacon. Jesus is the number one deacon. Jesus is the perfect deacon. And he's the example for all deacons. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. There's his service. There's the ministry. Although it came in many, many, many ways. The, the greatest expression of servanthood that Jesus ever demonstrated was when Jesus willingly took upon Himself your sin and my sin and laid His life down for us on the cross. There's where He was showing forth deaconhood in His greatest expression, a ransom for me. The most commonly displayed characteristic of sinful humanity is our obsession with the promotion of self. That's the greatest manifestation, the clearest, the clearest evidence of the fall of man is being obsessed with ourselves and acting as though that we're the center of the universe and, and promoting ourselves and being self-obsessed and self-promoting. Now, of course, it's, it's in our English word, uh, only in our English word, but you know the very middle word of a middle, very middle letter of the word sin is I. You know, and that's that's what sin is. It's being self-centered. It's doing life my way. It's wanting to rule my life and make my choices on my own. And building my kingdom. That's what sin is. That's what sin is all about. It's all about that middle letter of the word sin. It's all about me. That's what sin really is. But what is the agenda of true Christianity? The agenda of true Christianity is following Jesus and serving Jesus and serving others in His name. That's what Christianity is all about. It's about following Jesus personally. And serving Him, being a blessing to Jesus, and being a blessing to other people. In Jesus name. That's a pretty good summary, I think, of what it means to be a Christian. Through faith in Christ, we follow Jesus, we serve Jesus, and we serve people in the name of Jesus. John the Baptist got it right in John chapter 3 and verse 30 when he said, He must increase and I must decrease. John says, I've got to come off of the stage. I've got to get out of the spotlight. And life's got to be all about Jesus. He must increase and I must decrease. You see, the cross is the principle and it is the path of biblical Christianity. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, if anyone will come after he must deny himself and take up his cross. And when you read Luke's account of that, he includes the word daily. It's not something that's done last week or last month or last year. It's something that is renewed every day in our life. We deny ourselves. We take up the cross, which is self-crucifixion. And we do it daily. And we follow Jesus. Think with me here real quickly about the pride that's displayed in our world context in the city. They considered themselves to be worthy 
of sitting on the right hand and the left hand of Jesus in Jesus' kingdom. You talk about some presumption. You talk about a big head, right? You talk about somebody who thinks really highly of themselves. Uh, that's what's going on here. To, to think that they were worthy. Jesus, we want you to allow us to sit at your right and at your left in your glory. And I tell you what, I would imagine that those two guys probably were going to fight over which one was going to be at the right. Right and left hand in your Lord. Now you wouldn't ask Jesus a question like that if you didn't think that you were worthy. Right? <clears throat> to sit in the eternal kingdom of Jesus. Right next to Him. In His kingdom. In that position of authority and power. You wouldn't ask a question like that if you didn't think that you were worthy. Paul said in Romans chapter 12 verse 3 that by, the, by the grace given to me I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should. Instead, think sensibly. These guys were, were not thinking sensibly. Oh, the boldness. The boldness. The arrogance that is seen in their boldness in saying, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. They consider themselves worthy. I want you to know that if you consider yourself worthy of any blessing from God, you've got a problem with it's by the grace of God that any good thing from God comes to you. It's by the mercies of the Lord that we're not consumed in His judgment. And we don't deserve what well, I preach. I just want to get what I deserve. Let me take a few steps away from you. <laughs> right? Because, because I don't want to be close to you when you get what you deserve. We, we, we don't deserve. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve anything but heaven. That's all any of us really deserve. And, and, and to, to think that, that oh, we're going to get what we deserve from God, I'm so grateful I'm not going to get what I deserve They consider themselves worthy and they misjudge their hearts. And he says, you know, are you able to drink the cup? Are you able to be baptized? We're able. Verse 39, we, we are able. That's, that's ignorance being communicated in words. We are able. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Really? Really? We're able? Really? Now Jesus would say to them, you're going to drink the cup that I drink. You're going to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But they weren't able to do that by themselves. It would only be by God's grace. And even when they did, it would not be for the atonement of Sin. They would not have God turn His back on them, but instead God would be with them very closely as they went through their martyrdom and their suffering for Christ. Uh, God would, would be there for them, but instead Jesus would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus bore our sin and guilt upon Himself and died, in our place. Oh, let's not misjudge our hearts. Let's not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Let's not think that we are worthy of, of any blessing or any opportunity of service and ministry that we have from the Lord. Then notice with me thirdly that they cause a division. Their pride brought about division. When the other ten disciples heard this, they began to be indignant. They weren't just a little bit upset. Now, they were raging mad. Those other deep, those other disciples of, of, of Jesus, they became indignant with James and with John. You know, pride is probably the biggest reason for conflict in any relationship. Pride perpetuates conflict. Pride is, is, is obviously seen. I, I thought back, you know, when I read this, I thought about conflict, 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 examples of conflict, and what I've seen in conflict. When I've been in conflict with somebody else, 
was pride there, absolutely. Every conflict that I've seen in husbands and wives when I do marriage counseling with them, is there pride there? You better believe it. Conflict in churches. Now you might say, Pastor, you've never seen any conflict in church. In 40 years of being a pastor, I've seen my share of conflict in churches. I'll tell you, one of the, one of the dominant uh, characteristics of that conflict is pride. Pride. If pride is not at the very source of the conflict, I tell you, it gets in the mix very strongly. Pride. Anytime there's conflict in, a, in any relationship, any family, any church, any community, any nation, pride is always easily detected. And pride, people make demands that things be done the way they want things done. According to their reasoning, according to their preferences. And if you don't do it the way they want it done, and if you don't scratch their heads, then they get mad at you. What is that, preacher? That's pride. That's arrogance that would exalt me and my desires and my preferences and my will over what you like. Ring any bells? Conflict comes because of pride. Then notice the humility that is required. <clears throat> Jesus instructed them to be people of humility in verse 42. Jesus called them over and said to them, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, they dominate them. In the lost world, in a fallen world, Greatness means you've got people on you. You rise in greatness and you have more people under you. And the greater you are, the more people that you have under you. Carrying out your orders and, and being in submission unto you. That's the way it is in a fallen world, Jesus says. But that's not the way it is among you in the kingdom of God. On the contrary, if you're going to be great, then you're going to be served. The great people take basins of water and tile and wash the feet of others. Those are the great people. Whoever wants to be first among you becomes a slave to everybody else. And then Jesus himself demonstrated humility. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for me. Early on in my Christian experience, I memorized Philippians chapter 2. But instead of my quoting it to you, because I'll be quoting it from the King James, I want you to just look. I think I've got it for you on the screen. Philippians 2, verse 2. Do we have that? I didn't get that. It's not there. Philippians 2, verses 2 through verse 8. There it is. Fulfill my joy by thinking the same way having the same love, sharing the same feelings, focusing on one goal. That's Christian fellowship. He's talking to the church at Philippi. This is the way you're going to have to be in relationship with one another. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. Don't, don't try to exalt your plan and your way and put somebody else down. But in humility, consider others as more important than ourselves. You defer to others in humility. You, do, you defer to them. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests. There's nothing wrong with, with taking care of yourself and being healthy and providing for your family. All those things are clearly taught in the Bible. But he says don't just do that, but also for the, for the needs of others, the interests of others. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who existing in the form of God. I'm talking here about the pre-incarnate state of Christ prior to Bethlehem, okay? In eternity past. Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God. In other words, being recognized as being equal <coughs> in the Godhead. Equality with God as something to be used for His own advantage. See, Jesus came to this world how? In submission to the will of the Father. 
He's, he's, he, he, he said, my need is to do the will of Him who sent me. And so Jesus put Himself under the authority of the Father and He served the Father and served the Father's plan. And Jesus is here being put before us as our example that we serve. It's not our plan and our will and our kingdom, but rather we are in subjection to, to Him. And we are in subjection in the context of this to one another. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave and taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Humility before God in obedience to the Father and in humility before you and me and served us with the cross. Serving him in humility. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Oh. Humility is not just something that is suggested, humility is not something that is advised. I tell you, you just can't have Christianity apart from humility. Practical Christianity doesn't act out practically apart from humility. Those who are great in the kingdom are those who serve. They serve with a humble heart. Yielded, surrendered, dedicated to the well-being of other people. Love others in Jesus' name. That's a people and that's a follower of Jesus. Let's stand